that was the only announcement i made okay so today uh, we will uh, uh, we will continue this discussion uh, in particular uh, i am going to talk about the gram schmidt um, orthonormalization process Okay, so um, I uh, there's one definition I want to put down before I begin. This is uh, the definition of an orthonormal or orthogonal basis. So if you are given a basis consisting of vectors v1 through vn, um, of a vector space, vector space V uh, is said to be an orthogonal basis with respect to an inner product. So in order to say whether a pair of vectors is orthogonal or not, you need to have some notion of an inner product. And I denote that inner product by these uh, braces with two arguments here and a comma between them. Um, if this set V1 to Vn is an orthogonal set, What is an orthogonal set? We defined it in the previous class. A set of vectors are said to be orthogonal or mutually orthogonal if the inner product between any pair of vectors in that set is equal to zero. And we say that uh, it, this, uh, this basis is an orthonormal basis If um, it is orthogonal, and vi in a product with vi equals one for all i. Okay, that's one definition. So two two keywords that have come here: orthogonal basis and an orthonormal basis. OK, so um, uh, it turns out that uh, any uh, vector space V uh, and uh, inner product uh, defined like this uh, has an orthonorm uh, orthonormal basis. So the question is, how do you find such an orthonormal basis? So um, if you are given a basis for a vector space, then you can use the Gram-Schmidt process or the Gram-Schmidt algorithm to find uh, an orthonormal basis for the vector space V. And why are we interested in orthonormal basis will be clear uh, as we go further in the discussion. So the Gram-Schmidt process. or algo. So basically this is uh, the input. Um, so it's a set of vectors, say x1 through xn. And these are linearly independent vectors in C to the M. And what is going to be the output of this algorithm? Is a set of vectors Z1 through Zn. Um, 
is an orthonormal set of vectors. such that span of this first set of vectors or z1 through zn is equal to the span of x1 through xn. So by the way, um, actually the correct way of writing it, writing a sequence is always like this. You have to always write out the first two elements and then uh, separated by a comma, then a comma and exactly three dots, and then a comma and then the last element of the set Xn. Um, you should not put four dots, five dots and so on and there should be always these commas in between them. Uh, and you should always list the first two. But sometimes, as usual, I get lazy and I just write Z1 to Zn, where there is no confusion that I'm not skipping anything in between. It's just Z1, Z2 up to Zn. Okay, so this is how the procedure works. And I'll first put down the procedure and then maybe make some remarks as to why this procedure will yield a set of orthonormal vectors such that the span of these vectors is exactly the same as the span of x1 through xn. So I expect that you also seen this procedure previously. So this is more of a recap. Um, so um, you start out by saying um, let y1 be equal to x1 itself. And then you normalize it. So you set Z1. So I've already found out what Z1 is, the first vector. This is going to be Y1 divided by inner product of Y1 with itself, power half. So this means that Z1 is, is now normalized. I already mentioned this in the previous class. If you take uh, any vector divided by the square root of the inner product of that vector with itself, you will get a unit norm vector pointing in the same direction as the original vector. So Z1 is now normalized. Okay, now I want to find a Z2, which uh, is orthogonal to Z1, but span of Z1, Z2 will be span of X1, X2. So how do we do that? So we let Y2 be equal to X2, minus the uh, minus some uh, scaled version of Z1 and the scaling factor is the inner product between X2 and Z1. <coughs> so now uh, what this means is that this Y2 is perpendicular to Z1. Why is that true? So if I take the inner product between y2 and z1, that will be the inner product between x2 and z1. Inner products are linear, okay? So it's the inner product between x2 and z1 minus this coefficient times the inner product of z1 with itself. But z1 is already unit norm. And therefore, the inner product of z1 with itself is 1. So it's the inner product of x2 with z1 minus the inner product of x2 with z1, which is 0. So y2 is a vector that is perpendicular to z1. And then I normalize this and I set z2 equal to y2 divided by the inner product between uh, y2 and itself power half. So now z2 is unit norm and so on. So I proceed like this. And so um, just to kind of make it clear in the in the kth step, I let yk equal to xk minus the inner product between xk zk minus 1 times zk minus 1. 
minus the inner product between xk and zk minus 2, zk minus 2, and so on. Inner product between xk and z1 times z1. So what this means then is that yk will be perpendicular to all the previous vectors, z1, z2, up to zk minus 1. And so we can set zk equal to yk divided by inner product of yk with itself power half. <coughs> OK, so this is the overall algorithm and uh, you, you, you keep going up to uh, k equal to n. Sir? Yeah. Sir, can we say that orthogonal uh, vectors are linearly independent? Yeah, so uh, if you remember in one of the previous classes, I did say that any set of non-zero orthogonal vectors are linearly independent. And I said you should try to write out a little proof uh, for why that should be the case. OK, so obviously if I take the zero vector, the zero vector is orthogonal to every other vector. OK, you take the inner product of the zero vector with any other vector, you will always get zero. So orthogonal vectors are not necessarily linearly independent, but non-zero orthogonal vectors are linearly independent. Okay? Yes, sir. So, um, so just to make some remarks about this, just by construction, Um, at step k, we have that span of uh, z1 through zk, zk equals span of x1 through xk. And this is true for k equal to 1, 2, and so on. So at every k, this is actually true. So what this means is that if I want to write a linear relationship between um, x and z, then I can write this matrix z, whose columns are z1, z2, and so on. This is equal to the matrix x times r where R is an upper triangular matrix. So going forward, I'll use this notation to write upper triangular in short. Okay, so uh, if you look at this, so if R is upper triangular, what it means is that when I multiply, so just for the sake of completeness, I'll say here, Z is this matrix formed by Z1 through Zn. And X is the matrix formed by X1 through Xn. I don't want to put commas here. It's just stacking these next to each other. Okay, so if R is upper triangular, it means that if I look at the first column, remember I talked about how to view matrix multiplication. If I look at the first column of V, it's a linear combination involving only the first column of X. So basically that, that is what is captured by this equation here. If I take the second column of Z, it's a linear combination of the first two columns of X. Okay, and so it goes. 
Okay. And the second remark I want to make is that if x1 through xn are linearly dependent, remember I presented the algorithm by assuming that x1 to xn are linearly independent vectors in C to the m, but I can actually run this algorithm even if these vectors are linearly dependent. So if x1 through xn are linearly dependent, If they are linearly dependent, we can still use Gram Schmidt. Uh, to find a basis. And the dimension of span x1 through xn. So basically, how, how this happens is that if, for example, xk is linearly dependent on x1 through xk minus 1, then when you run this Gram Schmidt process and if you compute this yk here, it will turn out that yk will become equal to 0. So that is something you should convince yourself about. I'll write it down for you. And uh, you should again try to write out a small proof for that. Then, um, then, what, then what you can do is to skip uh, xk and then proceed. So you, you just don't compute a zk. You, you skip the kth z and then you proceed with yk plus 1. And then you run the algorithm. So basically, this is something you should show. If xk is linearly dependent on x1 through xk minus 1, then yk equals 0. So at the end of the uh, Gram Schmidt process, you will have an orthonormal basis for span of x1 to xn. So to be more clear, okay, these are two remarks, okay. Uh, any questions about the Gram Schmidt process? Okay, so um, uh, I'll make one other small remark. This is, uh, it relates back to some things we discussed in the previous class, actually two classes ago. So this is about, uh, it's a note about orthogonal complement subspaces. Okay, so um, recall that um, the range space of A is the orthogonal complement of, null of the null space of A transpose. So that means that um, AX equals B, if I take this system of linear equations, this has a solution if and only if. Um, so this will have a solution only if and only if B lies in the range space of A. If B is not in the range space of A, then it will not have a solution. So if B lies in the range space of A, it means that B must be orthogonal to any vector that lies in the null space of A transpose because the null space of A transpose is the orthogonal complement of the range space of A. So that, uh, you know, so put to put that in, in words, um, 
the way to write it is B transpose Z must be equal to zero for any vector belonging to the null space of any A transpose. Okay, uh, that is to say that um, for uh, for any z such that uh, a transpose z equals zero. Okay, so that's just a side remark I wanted to make about orthogonal complement uh, uh, subspaces. Yeah. 